Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It may be raining outside, but isn't it a beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord? Yes. Amen to that. Got a few announcements here. Tonight, or tomorrow night rather, 6 o'clock, eat and greet. It's soup night. On Thursday is the mobile food truck distribution. Come on down here and get some free food. And on Saturday at 9 a.m. is the fall work day at church all morning. There's a form in the bulletin that is for an updated church directory. If you want to be included, please return to Pastor Charlie. If you if you're info from the 2019 edition, which was the latest one, has not changed, you can just return and note that there has been no changes. Thank you. All righty. Well, this week, Tuesday, because it was going to rain on Monday, was going to be the start of the construction of the pavilion. I've read the forecast, and I'm a little doubtful that it'll be started on Tuesday either. However, as soon as the rain stops, uh, either we're going to build a pavilion or an ark out there. I'm not sure which, but uh, no, we're actually building a pavilion. And I'm announcing that because by next Sunday, it should be underway, and just try and steer clear of the area, uh, especially once they get into roofing and things where little nails might fly and never know where they might land in that general vicinity. Uh, so just kind of steer clear of that as we're building the pavilion. Uh, I'm, I'm hesitantly skeptical that the weather Tuesday is going to be much better than Monday from the forecast I heard. So uh, nonetheless, it will be started soon. And by next weekend, hopefully you'll be able to look out there and see at least poles standing upright, brace there ready for a roof and all the other good stuff. Uh, so please avoid that. Um, also, the Apple Butter Festival is coming quickly. And there are, you took a good number of the cardstock flyers. I made a few more. They're out on the breezeway table. If you know of a place to hang one of those flyers to advertise the festival, feel free to take a, one of those flyers and hang that anywhere you know of that might advertise the festival. Jamie and Mary would like to talk to you if you know of a business or yourself that would donate a new item for the Chinese auction that goes on at the festival that benefits the food pantry. You can give them a call and uh, ask them what to do or give them the information. The festival date is Saturday the 15th, so it's coming fast, uh, so take note of that. I also uh, would like to note that there's some other things coming up, not that we really want to think about it for most of us, but the handbell choir, if they're going to perform for Christmas, has to think about that a little earlier than I have to hit the shopping areas. So uh, if you're looking to be a part of the Christmas handbell choir. See Linda and she can give you some information. It's, they say it's easy to do. You don't have to read music. All you have to have is a ability to swing a bell and do that. So if you can do that, you might have a chance to be involved. Um, also, we're looking for nursery workers to be able to staff a nursery uh, as we move into the fall. On a Sunday, we might need it. If we look around today, if you were the nursery worker who was signed up for today, you probably wouldn't be needed. You could just go on about your normal business. But if we have little ones that do need a nursery, we would like to have helpers available. Shauna can take that information. If you can't cross paths with her, I'm always at the door. You can give me your name and tell me, and I'll tell her if she's gone somewhere chasing her kids or doing whatever hap happens after church. So uh, let me know about that. We do have to pretty quickly get that together. So uh, take note of that. And I have a thank you card. Uh, dear church family, I would like to thank you all for the many prayers and cards during Ray's ordeal with cancer surgery. He is now cancer free and doing well. Uh, God bless you all, Ray and Betty Lewis. So we've been praying for Ray, and we like that kind of result. We certainly thank the Lord for that. And uh, certainly thank God for his power and his provision. And that's why we pray. And so today we will also pray and ask God to provide for those today who need his provision. So let's join together. Almighty God, we thank you that you provide because we pray. We thank you for your healing touch. We thank you for answers to prayer, people whom have been healed, helped, strengthened, provided for. And today we come with others who have that same need this day. And we pray that even as we have a list before us of a, a multiplicity of names and situations and events uh, that are hurting physical bodies, we just pray for each one of these folks. We think particularly of those who are recovering from surgery and just pray that you would continue to uh, help them recover and to be strengthened for those who've had uh, procedures and those who are waiting for doctor's wisdom, that doctors might have wisdom that's necessary. 
We ask for uh, your provision for Fred this morning as uh, he's not doing well, and we just pray for him with uh, the care he's getting and just for your provision for him to come for him in the pain he's suffering. We pray that you'd be with ones who are adding to the list uh, for Sharon with a blockage and for doctor's wisdom as to how to deal with that. We pray for uh, Patty and for her doctor to have wisdom caring for her with a, a new physical need as well as for Doug and Bobby Joe who have COVID and are recovering. We pray for their health and strength for Priscilla's family. And just pray for all these needs that you would touch lives and help and provide. We pray for others who have different types of needs, those who are traveling, those who are on the road this weekend, those who are uh, enduring other hardships, the need perhaps for wisdom or guidance, direction, financial wisdom, those who have relationship issues, work-related issues, all kinds of things that we need you for. And we pray for every need that we might uh, trust you and see your provision as we trust you and pray and pr see you provide. Pray for our country and the needs of our nation. Pray that you would bless our nation and minister uh, to the spiritual needs that we have, drawing many people to understand that Jesus loves them, cares about them, has compassion upon them, and wants a relationship with the many millions in this country who today would reject him and now have nothing to do with him. Pray that they might have their eyes open to that understanding. Pray that you'd lead those who make decisions to make wise choices and godly choices. Pray that you'd be with our missionaries reaching around this world with the gospel and that you would help them and strengthen them in some difficult circumstances and situations, that you would just use them for your honor and glory. And we pray that you would be with our military men and women separated from families, many of them serving around this world as well, and that you would help them and keep them in your care and safety. We ask all these things because we know you're able to provide. We ask these things as we bring them before you on behalf of others, but we are also mindful that perhaps in this very room there are those who have need in their own life and in their own situation that isn't printed on this list, nor is it for public information, but it's a great burden to their heart. As we take a few moments for each of us as individuals to pray, we trust that you will answer these requests in the same way that you answer the requests that are prayed together for. For we ask them all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Open your Bibles to the book of Judges, the book of Judges. I'll be reading from chapter 3, verses 7 through 11. Judges, chapter 3, verses 7 through 11. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and forgot the Lord of their God, and served Balaam and the groves. Therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Chushan Mishathim, king of Mesopotamia. The children of Israel served Chushan Mishathim eight years. And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel, who delivered them, even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel, and went out to war. And the Lord delivered Shusham Mushathim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. And his hand prevailed against Shusham Mushathim. And the land had rest forty years. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. 
May God bless the reading of his word. Thank you. We'll have our kids come up for our children's chat. And yes, George drew the short straw for that scripture reading with a guy's name I can't pronounce. We're going to talk about to the kids something I can pronounce. I have a little picture here. Who recognizes this symbol? Ford. Ford. There's a lot of lovers of Ford out there. Yeah, look, they're all happy right now, Ford lovers, Ford fans. Where did where, some of our non-Ford fans go? Oh, he's way in the back. I've got to talk to him in a minute because he's a part of my story. Well, this is the Ford Blue Oval. You've all seen them if you've seen a Ford. Whether you want to own one or not, you've seen the Blue Oval. It's always in the front grill of every Ford in the last 20 years or 30 years. That Blue Oval sits there. This week it got leaked out, however. They are having supply chain issues, all the automotive companies. And Ford has been building mostly pickup trucks and some of the large SUVs with a particular size Blue Oval that slaps in the front grill except they can't get their blue oval that says Ford to slap in the front grill. So literally thousands of trucks have been manufactured fully functional. They run, they would drive. Even you non-Ford lovers, if I gave you one of them, you'd love to have one for free. And you Ford lovers would pay big money for one of those babies. And the only thing they lack is the Blue Oval. The rest of the truck is fully intact, ready to go. They just can't get the emblem to stick in the front grill, and they won't sell them without this stuck in the front grill. Now, this is where Frank comes in. Frank says, I can solve their problem, because at every junkyard, there's millions of these things, and they could just go robbing them out of the junkyard. But that's a good idea, Frank, but it won't work because this is a particular size in the new model of the Ford large truck and, and large SUVs. It's a different size than all the other ones. The other ones is too small, too big. They can't get this one. And so those trucks just sit there waiting for this to come along. The truck is no good without its emblem, is it? It's just not going to work well without its emblem. So what does this have to do with anything other than picking on Ford or GMC or your Dodge or whatever? Well, this reminded me of something. You know, Ford says without the emblem, the truck is of no value at all. Can't be sold, can't be driven off their lot, can't be loaded to take to your car dealer, can't be delivered to you if you've got one in order. It's no good without the emblem, Ford says. And I'm going to tell you something that, that you're in your life that we're no good without. And that's Jesus. He said it. Jesus said in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Then he said this about himself, for without me, you can do nothing. Without Jesus, we're like those Fords without an emblem. Sitting there, we can't do anything. Isn't that true? Without Jesus, we can't have the strength we need, the, the, the power we need day by day to overcome sin or temptation, the strength we need to go through days. You have a tough day. Do you need God's strength to get through those tough days? You need Him. Without Him, it's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to obey Him when every, every ounce of your body is saying, tell them what you really think. You ever told somebody what you, you really thought and it didn't go so well? especially if it was your parents. doesn't go so well, does it? Sometimes God has to give us the strength not to tell them what we're thinking we should say. Uh, and it's God who we need. And sometimes when we're, you know, sorrow-filled or there's something bad going on, we need Him. So yes, a Ford without its emblem is of no value. And we even more need the Lord in our life. Without Him, we can do nothing. So I hope you remember Ford's plight and their problem. If you have one of these at home, send it in to Ford. They'd appreciate No, don't, don't do that. Yes. Can you have the Ford emblem? We have a Ford lover. I will gladly bestow a Ford emblem upon you. The one that doesn't exist and that they're looking for. And if anybody wants the verse, I will be glad to share the verse. You'll take the verse. All right. 
Remember, without him, you can do nothing. You can head back to Children's Church. And as they wander out, we are in Judges, doing a series on the Old Testament Judges. And it's as we go through the book, and we'll be going through it at a pretty quick pace, not looking at every verse or every chapter even, we're going to find in this book that there's a lot of lessons for us today. And the lesson today is an overlying lesson that God delivers. God is a God of deliverance. Now that is going to be a theme that goes all through the book of Judges. It's an underlying theme. We're going to touch upon it today, and then we're going to look at some of the individual judges and some lessons we get from them. Some of you already know who some of the judges are. Remember Samson and some of the lessons he can teach us? We'll look at those lessons, but remember, Samson was also a judge who was going to deliver Israel, and God is a deliverer, not just of Israel, but of us. And so the theme that will run through the entire book of Judges under every illustration of a judge or what we're doing, is God delivers. I kind of compare this to your job, your employment, if you worked, or if you did work and you were now retired. There was a part of your job that went on all the time. It just is what you did. Um, you know, sometimes without much variety, sometimes with variety, but every job has an end result. When Gary's here, I pick on him because the end result of a chair company is to manufacture chairs. You know, at the end of the day, what, what has to happen? You have to have chairs manufactured. That's just what it is. Uh, in, in this group here, I see people who do all kinds of things for careers, and there's that certain thing you just, that's what you do. Um, for 15 years, I was a 911 dispatcher part-time when I used to live in eastern New York. And every day, you know, it was just another day that we had to get fire, ambulances, police, highway departments, train people to, for train repairs, utility people for power outages, dog wardens for dogs that aren't supposed to be where they are. We just had to get the right people to help people. And in the course of 15 years working part-time, I don't know how many of those I was involved in, but it's just a gigantic number of incidents. And yet, in the midst of that generalized, this is what we do, there's also those things that you kind of remember from those 15 years that stick out. I've already shared a couple of those. I remember I shared not long ago the child that was trapped in the recliner. That was very interesting. It wasn't your normal every day, I'm having chest pain type of call. And there's those highlights, and then there's sorry, sorrow-filled times as well. Uh, if you uh, happen to look at my Facebook page, when we were back in eastern New York, I visited the 911 center in Washington County. It's not the same one I worked in because they've redesigned it and they moved it, but it's a, it's a different one. And there was a picture of I and a guy named Art. And if you happen to look at that, Art and I were sitting there together. He was working the night I dropped in, along with another friend of mine. And Art and I shared something. It's not a, a happy thing, but it's one of those ironic things. Art worked there before I got there in 1997. And he'd worked there for some years before that, and he's still working there. He's a resilient type of guy. Uh, one morning I was uh, at home. I wasn't scheduled to work. Uh, there was no shifts that I was working that day. And I was reading the, the local paper back when you actually had a paper you read. Remember those days? And uh, the phone rang. And it was the supervising dispatcher who was on duty saying, can you come in? And I said, well, like when? Like now. <laughs> uh, okay. Arts had got to work for a day shift that day. And within 10 minutes of Art getting to work, there was a call from his home where he still lived. And his mom had had a heart attack. And she wasn't breathing. And the ambulance was going there. And they needed me to go in. And they needed somebody. They let Art go. So they were down one staff member back in the days where there was no slack, and they needed somebody as soon as possible. And having been told that, it didn't matter really to me that day what I had going on, which wasn't all that significant, something I could change. I said, sure, I'll be right in. And I went in and worked for Art, and uh, his mother did pass. Ironically, four or five years later, I was scheduled to be in for a midnight shift. It was April 1st in 2012, or 2011. And the nursing home where my mother was called and said she's going to the hospital. Uh, she'd had something very serious happen to her. And I was scheduled to be in at work at midnight. So I had my wife call dispatch and say, I'm not coming. They called Art and told Art what ha was going to happen. And Art said, I'll be right in. 
Isn't that unique how that happened when we covered for each other when you know, there was four or five years between those situations? We covered for each other. Now, those are not the happy stories, but they're the memorable stories. And I look at the book of Judges like this. All through the book, it's God delivers. God delivers. That's what God is in the business of doing during this time of Israel. But in the business of delivering, what God is also doing, and, and we'll see, is teaching some other lessons through these judges to us that are also important. So today we'll talk about what the business of judges is. God delivers. But as we move to these other judges, you'll see some very different things, those unique little circumstances that happen in the process of God delivering his nation of Israel. Last week we looked at the reason Israel needed deliverance. That was out of chapter 2. And that's because sin brings trouble. And sin continuously brought trouble to the nation of Israel. George did get the short end of the stick with that guy's name, that king that was, uh, took over Israel for those eight years. Uh, but what happened that he would come in was in verse 7. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God, and they served other gods. And so the situation is very bleak. The people of God, the only people in the world at that time, in the, the time that this passage comes from, that worship the true God of heaven were the children of Israel. And they forgot him. And they left him. And they were worshiping false gods and goddesses of the Canaanites. And so the Lord was angered against them in their rejection of him. And he allowed this king with, to me, the unpronounceable name of Mesopotamia, to come in to rule and to take over. And for eight years, they served this guy. What do you mean, served him? Well, serve back then was measured in this thing called tribute. We might call it taxes. Anybody out there just love to pay taxes? I mean, you know... September was property tax month for school taxes, right? Some of you got that bill, and it comes in the mail, if it still comes in the mail, and you said, oh, look at this. It's wonderful. I get to pay my taxes. You know, oh, it's great. It's gone up, too. It's even better. There's more of it I have to pay. And everybody says, anybody who says that is absolutely not rooted in reality. Well, what did countries do when they took over another country? They taxed them. Call it tribute, call it taxes, because they owned you. You paid tribute to them so they didn't attack you and obliterate you. It's a protection scam, so to speak. And if you didn't pay your taxes, they came in and extracted the tribute by force. And so for eight years, they were under Kushan whatever his name is, of Mesopotamia, and he was extracting money from the nation of Israel. Sin brought trouble, as would be expected. And for those eight years, they still persisted in worshiping the false gods. But finally, slow perhaps on the uptake, a little delayed perhaps to figure it out, the Jewish people came to understand and realize that they had abandoned their true God, They'd abandoned the God who had led them from Egypt and slavery, taken them across the Red Sea, taken them through the wilderness, brought them into the land of Israel under Joshua's leadership, who is now gone. And that God of great provision, they left him behind, turned their back on him, walked away. And what did they have for that effort? Eight years of lots of tribute with no end in sight. And so in verse 9, when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, and they cried to him to deliver them, God would raise up Othniel, the deliverer, the judge. And this passage tells us virtually nothing about this guy. We really don't know much about, except in broad generalities, what happened, except he was the judge that God raised to deliver. Othniel is told to us that he was Caleb's he was the son of Caleb's younger brother, so he's in the family of Caleb, who was Joshua's partner in most of the leadership of Israel in the previous generation. 
The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. God took hold of this guy, Othniel. And as God took hold of him and he gave his life to the Lord, the Spirit came upon him. He went out for Israel, led them to war and battle. And God faithfully led this king of Mesopotamia to be defeated into his hands. And they were free. God delivered them from this guy. God delivered them from the tribute and what was ongoing. He repent, as they repented, he allowed them to be free from this and delivered. And in verse 11, it looks like it ends with a happy ending. Don't you love happy endings? The land had rest for 40 years as Othniel lived and was a judge there. A 40-year deliverance period. That's, that's a wonderful thing. It was peaceful. The neighboring nations stayed where they belonged. God of Israel blessed the nation. There was a relationship restored. They had faith. They trusted him. And they worshiped him now again. They tossed out those false gods. And everything was good. George didn't get the privilege to continue reading. I just didn't have, have the heart to have George read this whole chapter. Uh, the names may get a little easier, but it just goes on. Because it didn't stay that way. Once again, the price of sin is expected. And so Othniel, 40 years later, passes away. And in verse 12, the happy ending gets undone. It says, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. The Moabites in Scripture come from the history of Lot and his descendants. And if you remember back in Genesis, you have Lot and you have Abraham and that whole thing. Lot's descendants were the Moabites. They lived across the, what would be the now, now known as the, the River Jordan and the, the Dead Sea that are in the valley, and they lived on the other side. Well, they decided they liked the lush land of Israel better. And so they decided to raise, attack, and come in. They were assisted in verse 13 by the children of Ammon and Amalek, Amalek, which were the Amalekites, who helped them. They came in. They took the city of palm trees, which is Jericho. And now what happens? Verse 14, the children of Israel served Eglon, king of Moab, for 18 years. What does that mean? More taxes. Everybody who loves taxes... Now you get to pay them for 18 years to this combination of nations across the valley. Isn't that special? You know, you had eight years of taxes. You repented of your sin. God came and delivered you. 40 years of peace. And if you've lived through all of this, now you go into another period of time where you reject the God of Israel again. You once again serve the false gods and goddesses of the nation around you and of the Canaanites. And the next enemy rolls in, the Moabites. And now 18 years of paying tribute to them. Sin brings bad result. And I think we who are believers understand that, though we still sin at times. We understand when we sin, and it comes back to bite us, so to speak. We say, what did I do? You know, I should have known this. I've been down this road before. You say that in this circumstance, and it never goes well. I talk to the kids about what sometimes they might say to their parents. The, the, the strength you need to, to, for God to tell you not to say that and don't do it. But we adults haven't mastered the lesson much better. And it's not our parents we're saying it to anymore. It's people who are around us or coworkers or a boss or something. We just shouldn't say that. But, but we know that. But when the time is right, what, what, what's coming out of our mouth? Yep, that which we know we shouldn't be saying. We can't bite our tongue quick enough. And the, the result is still the same. You know, when you call somebody a jerk 10 years ago, the result's the same today, isn't it? It just doesn't get any better. People don't respond better today to being called bad names. It just hasn't got better. We know who are believers, and sometimes non-Christians don't understand or, and are trying to figure out why is it that every time I do this, the results are so bad. Sometimes it's because what they're doing is sin if they're not a believer in Christ. And once again, Israel 
tosses the God that they followed, the God who kept them at peace, the God who blessed them for 40 years, they say, here's the door, God. We're going to worship these false gods now. And what happens? 18 years now under Moab. And then a judge comes along, and some of you will be a fan of this guy because he's unique. His name is Ehud. And Ehud, in verse 15, is a left-handed judge. Yeah, okay, we've got the fans. Some of our fans of Ford. Some of you are fans of left-handed people. I'm as right-handed as right-handed comes. I don't do much of anything with my left hand. I write, I bat, I, anything I do, I do it with this hand. This hand's here for the ride most of the time, or to assist this hand. But you left-handers are different. You're, you're backward. No, that's not it. You're, you know, the, the left-handers say they're in their right mind because, you know, the right mind controls the left and the left mind controls the right. Here's the guy who you'll like to meet in the Bible. Verse 15, right in the middle of the verse, it talks about him. It says, the children of the Lord cried unto the Lord after 18 years. It took them 18 years to figure this out, that that's why they were in this mess. And they cried to the Lord, and he raised up a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjaminite, a man left-handed. And God says, I need to point that out to you folks. Left-handed folks have value in the kingdom of God, as well as us right-handed folks. It doesn't matter. And as he sends him out, he sends him out to undo the Moabite reign through Eglon. And I'm not going to read this whole passage because it just goes on. To, to boil it all down, the deliverance was made when Ehud delivered the, the, the tribute. He brought the goods. Of course the king is wanting to see the guy who brings all the tribute, right? Here's the guy hauling in uh, chariots full or wagons full of taxes and taxable wonderful stuff, gold and maybe animals, all kinds of stuff coming in. And he says, I want to meet with the king. Well, the king's pretty happy to meet with the guy who's bringing all this stuff, and he uh, meets with him. And as you go through this passage, you can read it by yourself if you'd like. He hid on his thigh a very sh short sword that he had made himself. And when he and the king were alone, he stabbed and killed Eglon. And then he snuck out and left. And they waited for Ehud and Eglon to come out of their meeting and... Ehud comes out, and Eglon's still in there. Finally, after they waited for a while, they realized something might be wrong, and they found him, and they found him dead. Ehud went back to the nation of Israel. He gathered what armies they had and said, Now is the time to attack the Moabites while their king has been killed. They attacked the Moabites, and it all comes down to, as you read through these verses, that God was with them, and they threw out the Moabites. They tossed them aside, and God once again delivered them. Because that's the message of this book. The basic message of every judge, the message of every day is what? God delivers. And I want to tell you, that's not a message that is reserved for these old people back way back when. If there is anything we need to understand today, that that basic message of deliverance, God is still a God of deliverance. It may not be from kings or Moabites, or it may not be from a guy who you can't pronounce his name, who was the king of Mesopotamia, but God still delivers, and God is still in the daily business of deliverance. And you might say, what does God deliver from today? Well, there's one thing to start with that you absolutely need deliverance from, and that is sin. Sin produces horrible results. Not just with Israel, not just back then, but in our lives. And without the forgiveness of God, the horrible result of sin is for us to, in eternity, have to stand before God and answer for all of it. Unforgiven. While there was forgiveness through Jesus provided, a way of forgiveness provided, if we are like the Jewish people to turn our back on the deliverance of God, that's not going to be a friendly moment. When God says, I gave you every provision you would have needed to have every one of your sins forgiven. And you said, no. You said, I don't have time for that. I don't need that. I'm too busy. I don't believe that really can happen. 
Did this Jesus really die? I don't, I don't think so. Do I really need forgiveness? Or will God maybe t just take me as I am, sinful or, or not? And it's not not, as we all know. And for whatever reason, we just say, I don't need this guy, Jesus. The Jewish people here didn't need the God of Israel, and they forgot him. They said, forget him. We don't need him. And sadly, by thousands and millions in this world today, there are people saying, the exact same thing. The deliverance we need first is the deliverance from the sin that we have done ourselves. Not the sin of your neighbors, <clears throat> not the sin of your spouse, not the sin of your kids, not the sin of the leaders of a nation, not the sin of other nations. When you stand before God, you're not going to answer for any of those things. You're only going to be looked at for the sin you've committed. You and you alone. And there is deliverance available found in Jesus Christ. God is a deliverer. And Jesus was on that cross dying for our sin to deliver us from the punishment penalty of the sin we commit. There's full, complete, total deliverance available. But only if we make the choice to receive it. What did the Jewish people have to do before God raised up a judge? Well, the first time it took them eight years and they had to cry out to the Lord. They had to turn back from the idols and say, God, we've been wrong for eight years. We've worshipped these little idols. They haven't accomplished anything. Now we understand we need you. The second time, was it an automatic eight years and God just showed up? No. Eighteen years. And then they cried out, God, we for 18 years this time followed after these idols, the wrong gods, the gods who did nothing for us, and now we realize we need you. And when we first come to Christ, the thing we need most is forgiveness of sin. And if we come to Christ, what does he do? He forgives sin. It's a wonderful thing Jesus talks about in his ministry. We looked at it in Sunday school today. I'm the bread of life. If you come to me, I will sustain you. I will forgive you. I will be your God. Jesus said over and over again, come unto me. He said one time, come unto me, all ye who are labored and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He challenges us to believe, to respond, to accept him and understand by faith that he died for us. <clears throat> and as such, then, if we do that, we find the first deliverance from that which we need deliverance most from, sin. But does God stop there? I came to Christ when I was 17 years of age. Wasn't all that old, but old enough. And I knew there was plenty of sin piled up through 17 years of living. And I knew I needed deliverance. I needed forgiveness. So God forgave me, and then he hasn't looked back since, nor done anything for me since. Is that the God we serve? No. For the God of Israel not only delivered them, but first time he gave 40 years of peace in the land. The second time, the land was at verse 30 of this same chapter. The land had rest four score years. Once again, for years God preserved the nation of Israel. And so once we come for deliverance from our sin and the forgiveness we need, what does God do for us then? He just continues to deliver us. What do we need deliverance from? We need deliverance from sinful temptation. We need deliverance from sinful attitudes. You know, some of us have sinful attitudes that are truly strongholds. Uh, anger, defeat or discouragement, fears, lust, materialism. And we, we struggle with those things. We need deliverance. And what does God do? He delivers. That's his thing. Are we deliverers? Anybody here, you're a deliverer. That's what you do all your life. You deliver. You know, you, you help other people and you deliver for them. I doubt it. I can't deliver for even me some days. More or less somebody else. Human deliverance is limited completely. 
God's ability to deliver is unlimited completely. Whatever you're in the midst of today and you need deliverance from, or you need the delivering hand in the midst of it, whom should you seek? If you look at the book of Judges, it's the God who's in the business of delivering. When I was a 911 dispatcher, they called us for help using those three little digits, 911. And we delivered to them, hopefully, the kind of help as best we could figure out that they needed. That was our business. And so when you call upon the Lord, what's his business? To deliver. That's his business. That's what he's all about, deliverance. When you call upon the Lord and say, God, help me, he's a God of help. He's a deliverer. And it comes first with our relationship being established, seeking him for deliverance of sin and the forgiveness we need, but it goes from there to the deliverance we need every day, be it temptation, be it fears, be it worries. He's a deliverer. And we certainly are people who need deliverance. I read an interesting story, and it's quite interesting. <clears throat> Last year in Chicago, there was a, an apartment fire. It was a multi-story building. And of course, these days when you have a fire, what are people doing? Well, they pull their camera, now also their phone, out of their pocket, and they start filming. Of course, right? Because what's better to film than this apartment building that's burning down? Chicago firemen are fighting the, the structure fire. They're running around doing what they do, trying to get in the building, get hoses and all that, and people are filming. And from across the street, they're not real close, but it was pretty clear that up on the front of the building, on the fifth floor, in a window that was left open, appears a black cat five stories up. So the, the murmur in the crowd was, look, a cat. And it doesn't look good for the cat. The cat's up there for a brief period of time on the ledge of the window looking and looking, and finally the cat decided there was only one thing to do. The cat put, landed his front feet, reared back, and jumped. Five stories, landed on the grass below, rolled a couple times, got up and ran off, apparently completely uninjured. They do have nine lives. Well, that one had eight left, I believe, after this. You know, sometimes you say, wow, that's almost miraculous. I'm not the guy jumping five floors unless I have to, and I don't believe I'm going to run away unscathed if I do that. Sometimes we're that cat. And sometimes we say, God, help me. And the only reason we land on our feet and the only reason we get up and walk away isn't because we're so good. It's because God's so good. And God's in the business of sometimes delivering us when we shouldn't be left standing at the end of the day. And you know, that cat's the illustration in a sense of how sometimes God takes care of us. We can do nothing but jump and say, God, help me. And sometimes, if you're a believer in Christ, and your faith is in the Lord, and we have to jump ahead, not necessarily out of a physical window, but we have to move forward without a clue how it's going to end, without a clue how it's going to work out. We just know we've got to go and do this because it's the right thing to do. And we say, God, help me. What's God in the business of doing? Delivering. That's his business. If you need help, who should you call upon? The God of Baal? The God of your money? The God of your ancestors? Or the God you have a relationship with through Jesus Christ? That's the one. He's the deliverer. And that's the theme that runs from Judges 1 till the end. Yes, we're going to look at some of the other judges, the things they did, the things they got into, the lessons they perhaps individually teach us. But the theme of the book that you should not forget is when you need deliverance, God over and over and over again is a deliverer. That's what he's in the business of doing. And if you need deliverance today in your life, don't look to me. I, I might help, but I, I'm not the deliverer. Don't look to somebody else. Look to him. He's the God of deliverance. And if you've never believed by faith and trusted that he died on the cross for you and you need deliverance from your sin, that's what you need to do first. That's the only deliverance that counts. Today, 
is to be delivered from the sin that will keep you from him for eternity. God is in the business of deliverance. Father, we thank you for the word. Thank you for a couple of people you raised up back then to teach us that you are a deliverer. Help us to have experienced that deliverance by seeking you for forgiveness of sin, the greatest need that we have. And that once we've done that, may we see you work in our lives to deliver us from things that are troubling, that are overcoming, that we think are so difficult, and perhaps humanly they are, that we'll never overcome them. Turning to the one, you, who is in the business of deliverance. And we thank you for what you do for us, that this isn't just a lesson about what you did for them way back when, but this is a reminder of what you can do for us today in our lives. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. In your hymn book, we'll close this morning with number 404, The Solid Rock. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. It's a wonderful song, and it really talks about he who delivers. Our hope is built on nothing less than the one who delivers, Christ the rock on which we stand. Let's stand together. All four verses, 404, The Solid Rock. Father, bless us this week as we think about the deliverance we can have and find through Christ. Help us in those moments that we need your deliverance. Help us to seek you. Help us to ask of you. Help us to find that which you have available for us, but that we need sometimes to claim by faith and belief and trust. And help us to have that trust that we will be standing on the rock, not the sinking sand of this world, the sinking sand of sin, and all the sinking sand that's around us, but we'll be standing on you, our rock, our deliverer. And we thank you for what you'll do for us. And we ask these things this day, not only to encourage our hearts, but to minister to us this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>